Thank you, praise team, for leading us to God's throne in worship. This is our 25th week in the book of Revelation. We've been making our way through this book week by week since the week after Easter, if that gives you any context at all. It's been quite a while since we've been uh, going in this book. I feel like we've set a pretty good pace. Uh, You may disagree. You may say, oh man, we've been in this book forever. Or you may say, we've been going too fast, like we've been covering too much each week. That's where I like to get, right in the middle, where I'm kind of offending people on both sides. I think that's a good a good place to be uh, for me. But one of the goals I set as we started out in this journey in Revelation, it, it was to read every single word of the book of Revelation here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. So as of right now, we have studied through 16 chapters together, which is about 279 verses or 7,768 words if people are taking notes on that kind of thing. My prayer, though, is that you'd be blessed through the midst of this and that you would continue to be blessed as we march through this word, uh, this, this book, word by word. Today, we're going to add chapter 17 to, our, uh, to that number, which adds another 18 verses or 521 if you're still keeping track, 521 words. So Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 18. If you would stand with me, give honor to the reading of God's word. You know me by now. I like to uh, ask questions. I like response, uh, but I won't be able to hear your answer. So I guess just shout out whatever today. Verse 1, chapter 17. Everybody there? I didn't hear anything, did Was that right? Okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm not just, uh, just completely there. Okay, chapter 17, verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Come and I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who is seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls, and she had a golden cup in her hand filled with everything detestable and with the impurities of her prostitution. On her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes and of the detestable things of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. And when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up from the abyss and to go to destruction. Those who live on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast that was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated, and there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain for only a little while. The beast that was and is not is itself an eighth king, but it belongs to the seven and is going to destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will do what, church? Conquer them, because he is who? The Lord of lords and the king of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute was seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And the ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his plan by having one purpose and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman you saw is the great city that has royal power over the kings of the earth. Okay, I know that this chapter is full of symbolism and metaphor, and maybe it is is a little 
discouraging or worrying for you this morning, but we're going to walk through it, and we're going we're to find this morning that this is actually one of the easiest chapters in the book of Revelation to understand. It's all talking about one thing, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to walk through this chapter. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. It's another day that you have made. It's another opportunity to bring you glory. I pray that today we would, like Clint prayed earlier, Lord, that we would set aside our distractions and focus our hearts and our minds on you. I thank you so much this morning that we can sit in this place. Lord, first of all, for the freedom that we have in our nation, because brave men and women have sacrificed their lives and have given so much so that we could be free. But Lord, more importantly, I praise you this morning that because of the blood of Christ Jesus shed on Calvary's cross, that we have access to your throne, that we can gather together as your body and praise your name and give you glory. I thank you for that privilege, and I pray that this morning we would open your word, we would be transformed by it, Lord, and that today would be a day that would bring you praise and honor and glory from our lips, from our hearts, and from this time that we have together. We ask all these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. So like I said, chapter 17, maybe a little intimidating. There's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of different things going on, but we're going to walk through it. Don't let it discourage you. One of the simplest chapters to understand. Once you get the two symbols, everything else kind of falls in place. So let's talk about these two symbols, and then we're going to jump into this. Number one, the notorious prostitute. The notorious prostitute. I had to change my notes this week. I just want to give you a little... uh, a, a little insight into how we do your bullets and notes and different things. Um, I, I noticed as, as we went through the week, I looked at the bulletin and, and looked at it, and I realized that I was going to make you guys write prostitute in church. And so I changed it around, so you just had to write notorious. But let's talk about this, uh, this notorious prostitute. She is the personification of Babylon. It's written on her forehead in verse 5, and it's explained more clearly in verse 18. Babylon is not what we see in the Old Testament, the, the kind of the, the city of Babylon or the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon represents the world in the spiritual sense of that word. Not, not, the, not the earth beneath our feet, but the, the, the dark, wicked, rebellious system that's pervaded humanity from the beginning. That's Babylon. It's every government that rules with injustice. It's every worldview that sets itself against the Lord. It's the opposite of God's kingdom. Satan rules over Babylon, and it's what he desires for this entire world. He tirelessly works to expand its influence. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says this, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world. According to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. That's Babylon, the ways of this world. So when you look at the news and you look at uh, what's going on in this world, you look at all the different things that are happening, and sometimes things make your blood boil, right? You you read things and you say, God, what is going on here? What is is happening with this? What is happening in our nation? How, How are people falling so far away? This is Babylon. That's what we're talking about here in this in this chapter here, the ways of this world. That's the prostitute here in chapter 17 that we're going to talk about. It's the kingdom of darkness that Satan reigns over. And his kingdom has one goal, church. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what Babylon is. It's attempting. It's a system that's trying to keep people away from the gospel. So that's the first symbol. The second symbol, what do we see in verse 1? I'm sorry, verse... Yeah, go on. No, I'm sorry, verse 3. Then he carried me away to the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw the woman, who was Babylon, sitting on what? A scarlet beast. This is the same beast. This is not a new beast. In the book of Revelation, this is the same beast that we've been talking about all the way through the book of Revelation. He was introduced in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, as the first horseman in the apocalypse. He was described in chapter 11, verse 7, as the beast that comes up out of the abyss to make war, conquer, and kill the saints. And then in chapter 13, we spent quite a bit of time there talking about 
him in greater detail as the Antichrist, who is going to come and deceive the world and cause everyone to worship the devil. Okay, so here in context, let's talk about this. The prostitute, what does it represent? Babylon, or this world, and the, the beast, who is that? The Antichrist, good. So in context here, this prostitute is Babylon, is carried on the shoulders of the beast who is the Antichrist. So Satan is using his greatest weapon to bring about his greatest influence. Can, let's, can we just, let's be real for a second. How are things going in this world? Talk to me. I can't hear you, but talk. Bad, okay? <laughs> That's a good way to say it. Uh, tell me something that you heard this week that discouraged you. Nothing? You had a good week? There are 700 parentless children in our county. Homeless children. Homeless children going to school. Talk to me. More. What have you heard? What discouraging things have you heard? I heard Russia. That can be pretty discouraging. Keep talking. So safe to say, things are not looking the best, church. Sometimes we look at this world and we look at what's happening. We look at the news. We look at all these situations. And there's this tendency to say, how, how, how on earth is this going to work out? Lord, how, why, why aren't you doing anything about any of this? What's going on here? You know, in Scripture, this isn't the first time that they faced kind of an unbeatable enemy. How about when Israel left Egypt, left their slavery in Egypt, and they were traveling, and they got stuck between the Red Sea and an army that was behind them? How did God respond to them? He opened the Red Sea and brought judgment down on their enemies. How about when Gideon faced 10,000 Midianites with only 300 soldiers? That was an impossible situation, but what happened? God brought victory. How about when Israel was challenged by a, a giant named Goliath, that nobody could defeat, and the situation seemed hopeless, how did God respond? With David. How about when 185,000 Assyrian troops besieged Jerusalem in 2 Kings chapter 19? Anybody remember that story? The next day they woke up, and what did they find? All of them were dead and gone. See, throughout Scripture, we see kind of this idea that when Babylon rears its ugly head, God responds in Force. And David, he understood this. Listen to his desperation in Psalm 74. This is King David writing this. God, how long will the enemy mock us? Will the foe insult your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand? Stretch out your right hand and destroy them. Remember, the enemy has mocked you and foolish people have insulted your name. Do not forget the lives of your poor people forever. Consider the covenant for the dark places of the land are full of violence. Do not let the oppressed turn away in shame. Let the poor and needy praise you. Rise up, God. Champion your cause. Remember the insults that fools bring against you all day long. Do not forget the clamor of your adversaries, the uproar of your opponents that goes up constantly. See, David, he saw the influence and the effect of Babylon on this world, and he cried out, church, to the only hope that we have. Because we can sit here today and talk about all these issues that you guys brought up, all these things that are, that are a threat to us right now, and we can try to figure them out. We can sit here and we can brainstorm and try to figure out, okay, so what are we going to do about this? And what are we going to do about this? And, and how can the government help us here? We can do all these things, but it's still going to get worse and worse and worse unless we turn to the one who can change this. The Lord of Lords, the 
king of kings. And here's my encouragement for you this morning. Babylon is going to fall. The the systems of this world, they're not going to last. The unbeatable will be beaten. Sin will be laid low by our righteous champion, Jesus Christ. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to prevail over this wicked world. And as surely as David took down Goliath, God will have victory. We keep going back to this over and over and over in the book of Revelation because that's the key, is to see Jesus Christ in victory over his people. And when David beat Goliath, it wasn't the stone that really ended him. What was it, church? We don't talk about this in kids' Sunday school much, do we? He took his own sword and he ended it himself. There's kids again. Let's let's be gentle. But Jesus Christ is going to have victory. We don't live in this world permanently. This is not it. This is not the only thing. As quickly, we're going to walk through this text this morning. We're going to look at it in in kind of a, a different way. But I want you to see one thing just throughout this text. I want you to kind of grasp that we are not citizens of Babylon. We're not citizens of this place. We are temporary residents of this world. We're pilgrims moving through. Colossians 1.13 tells us, He, the Lord, has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. Our citizenship is in heaven. And I know things swirling around us, these issues, these problems, these concerns, these, these pressures being placed on us. Listen, Lift your eyes up to the Lord this morning. Trust in him. Our citizenship is not here. One day we're going to stand in the presence of the king for all eternity. So chapter 17 of Revelation, it's a description and an exploration of the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of darkness. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at that description and I want to contrast it with the kingdom of heaven that we as believers are a part of today. The first thing we see, the kingdom of of Babylon, the kingdom of darkness is wicked and immoral. Look at verse one with me. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Come and I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who's seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her. And those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. He carried me away to the wilderness in the spirit to a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. All right, so we see kind of the introduction of this. We see several things we learn about the kingdom of this world right now, right here from these verses. Prostitution, sexual morality, blasphemy, and detestable things. All right, we're not painting a great picture, are we? But we know this. As we live in this world, these things are evident to us. We, we look at the world and we say, this, this world is set against the Lord. That's the kingdom of this world, wicked immoral, deviant, and corrupt. Then verse four is really interesting. I I enjoyed studying that this week. Verse four says, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. What does that mean to be dressed in purple and scarlet? Uh, You're probably right. I just couldn't hear. Adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls. What does it mean to be adorned in gold, jewels, and pearls? Wealthy, kingly, right? And then it says, she had a golden cup in her hand. You see, the world gives you this. It looks like this, and look at all that we have. Look at what we offer. We offer wealth. We offer all of these different things. You'll have all the royalty. You have all these different things to tempt us. But what was in her cup? It was filled with everything detestable and with the impurities of her prostitution. Jesus said something similar to the the Pharisees. He told them that they uh, they were a whitewashed tomb, that they looked good on the outside, but on the inside, they were filled with death and corruption. This, is, this, this world has all the trappings of wealth and glory, but inside, it's rotten and wicked. But church, I'm going to say this over and over and over today. We are not citizens of Babylon. We're not, we're not part of this world. The kingdom of heaven operates with a completely different set of standards. The kingdom of darkness, it's wicked and it's immoral, but God's kingdom is righteous and holy. Righteous and holy. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, for, na- for know and recognize this, every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a pretty exclusive statement. There is one way 
into the kingdom of heaven, church. Where is it? Through the church, right? Through my preaching, right? Through the waters of baptism, right? That's how you get into heaven, right? It's, it's by taking communion. That's how you get into heaven, right? It's by doing good things, right? No, I, I heard a lot of no's. I, I heard that very clearly. Church, it's not about any of those things. It's through believing by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. The people of this world, right, the system of this world is immoral and corrupt, but God's kingdom is righteous and holy. Matthew 13, 43 says, the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Righteous and holy. And remember, none of this comes from us. This isn't, this isn't a plea today as you live in, in the kingdom of heaven and you operate by heaven standards. You're, you're not going around saying, I'm going to try harder to be better. That's the trap. Because church, if we didn't earn our salvation, we're not going to be able to keep our salvation. Jesus gives you your salvation in his sovereignty and in his mercy and in his grace. And it's his righteousness that we enjoy. So this, this wicked and immoral world, we contrast it with the righteous and holy kingdom of heaven. Number two. This world is violent and unjust. Violent and unjust. Look at verse 6. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. And when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Look at verse 14 with me. Keep moving. These, talking about the people of the world, will make war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will conquer them because he's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Go down to verse 16 with me. The 10 horns that you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. They'll make her desolate and naked, devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. This is this, is this world. This is a, a description of what's happening in this kingdom of darkness in this world. Blood and war and injustice and hatred and violence. That's the kingdom of this world. Jesus talked about this in John 8, 44. He said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires because he was a murderer from the beginning. That's, that, that's what this world is all about. And it's ironic now that when you look around, what's being preached is tolerance. Oh, you should be tolerant to everybody. But it, what's, I, which just blows my mind is how the those who preach tolerance are often the most intolerant people on the face of this earth toward those who believe this message. Every time that you watch the news and you see a story that makes your blood boil, that's the kingdom of this world. Every time that you see a story of a murder, there's a very, very big case going on right now. There's actually several big cases going on right now, and, and, we, and we should keep up to date with all this stuff. We should look, but we should realize that that's the system of this world. Every murder that you see, every time that you hear a story about rape or a child that was killed or anything that makes you just angry to be part of this, all of this injustice, that's the kingdom of Babylon. That's what Satan wants. He wants chaos to reign. But we, church, are not what? We're not citizens of Babylon. The kingdom of heaven is redemptive and it's just. Hebrews 1.8 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. He will make all things right. Do you believe that today? It's hard to, isn't it? When you watch the news and you see how bad things are, but do you believe that today? All things right. Every dark moment of your life will one day be illuminated by the glorious light of our risen Savior. Every scar that you hold right now, it's gonna be healed. Every painful memory that you have is gonna be turned into an opportunity to praise. His name. He's going to set all things right. His kingdom is redemptive and it's just. Number three, the kingdom of darkness is earthly and inconsequential. Inconsequential. Earthly and inconsequential. Look at verse seven with me. The angel said to me, why are you astonished? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast and the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast you saw that was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss will go to destruction. Those who live on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast that was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. 
And here's the interpretation. This is what we're talking about. We've talked about since the beginning that the book of Revelation is very symbolic. And so a lot of the things that we read are full of metaphors. So this is the beast in his seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are what, church? Seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also what? Seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other is not, has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain only for a little while. Look at verse 15 down there with me. He said to me as well, the waters that you saw where the prostitute was seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So we're getting a little bit more description about the, the Antichrist and what he, what he is, how he rules, and, and the, 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 those kings that are gathered around him. The seven heads of the beast represent seven mountains and seven kings who rule nations. Tell me what all of this has in common, though. I'm going in a very specific direction here. All of these kingdoms are what? I, maybe I'm phrasing this in a, in a weird way. Maybe my brain is the only one going in this direction. All of these things are earthly. All of these things are, are completely bound by geography. He's just talking about things of this world, nations of this world, people of this world. Uh, he, he's talking about mountains and, and ge geographic locations in this world. The best the devil can produce and influence is earthly and ultimately inconsequential. He didn't have any more authority than what God gives him, and his authority is limited to this world. When we talk about his kingdom, we're talking about a kingdom of dirt and blood and stones. He doesn't have any power over your eternal soul. Your soul is held in the hands of a mighty God. He has no power beyond this world. But we, church, are not what? We're not citizens of Babylon. The kingdom of God is heavenly, and it's essential. Heavenly and essential. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. So where, where Satan rules this world, God says, my kingdom is not of this world. 1 Corinthians 4, 20 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. We serve an omnipotent king, the God of all creation, the glorious I am. And his kingdom that you're a part of this morning is heavenly and essential. That's why Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things. Let's keep moving. Number four, the kingdom of darkness is temporary and limited. Temporary and limited. Let's look at verses 10, 11, and 12. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain for only a little while. So the, the, the influence of the kings that are surrounding the Antichrist their influence only lasts for a little while. Verse 11, the beast that was and is not and is itself an eighth king, but it belongs to the seven and it's going where? Verse 11, going to destruction. Verse 12, the 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for how long? One hour. You see, all three of these things, we're talking about three different verses, three different realities all about the shortness of the kingdom of Satan, all about the shortness of the kingdom of Babylon, the temporary nature, the limited time that Satan has to rule. You may be sitting here this morning, and you may say, man, but it seems like I've been going through this for so long, and it seems like these problems have existed for so long. Listen, church, a thousand years to us is, is like a day to the Lord. One day, one day, this kingdom will fall. It's temporary, it's limited, it's bound by time, it's fragile. There is an expiration date on Satan's rule. But we are not citizens of Babylon. The kingdom of heaven that we're a part of today is eternal and boundless. Daniel 7, 14 says, His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Hebrews 12, 28 says, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. If there's nothing else that comforts you this morning, if there's nothing else that comforts you in this dark and weary world that we live in, may it be this, there's a promise of eternal rest in Jesus Christ for you right now. I don't know, I don't know what you're going through. You may be going through the worst time of your life right now. You may be going through the, the toughest time that you've ever experienced as a family. But listen, it's not going to last forever. One day, we're going to stand in the presence of our king for all eternity. You know, when you go on vacation, 
and there's so much anticipation built up to that vacation, right? You, you're packing, you're getting things ready, you got your checklist, you're like, we're determined to have fun every minute of every day, and, and you go and, and you do this amazing vacation, and then you get home. Tell me about that feeling when you first get home, and you drop your bags, and you're, you're at home. What do you feel? You need a vacation. I need a vacation from the vacation that I just had, right? But sometimes it can be a little disappointing, like, well, that's done, I guess. Just spent $10,000 to go to Disney World, and I saw Mickey, and then I got to go home. What's, what's going on here, right? There's this moment where, where you're just kind of disappointed that the time is over, and then you know, well, I got to go to work tomorrow. I got to do all these things tomorrow. But this is the difference is that in eternity, we get to stand in the presence of our king face to face. We get to worship his name. We get to touch him. We get to see him and praise him and join together with all the saints in in, in all of creation for all of eternity, there's never a moment where we're going to stop and say, well, I guess this is going to be over tomorrow. We will worship his name forever. Now, here's where I'm going to end. And it's a little surprising because comparing and contrasting these two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of heaven, there's actually one thing that both kingdoms have in common. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven, what could they possibly have in common? Let's read verses 14 and 17. So these, talking about the kingdom of this world, these will make war against the lamb, but what will happen? The lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of lords and the king of kings, and those with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And then look at verse 17. For God has put it into their hearts. He's talking about the kingdom of darkness. Put it into their hearts to carry out his plan by having one purpose, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. The only thing that these two kingdoms have in common is that they will both ultimately bow before King Jesus. They will ultimately bow before King Jesus. Satan will bow before King Jesus before he is cast into hell. I, I, I know that's a big statement, but does that not give you some comfort the tempter of, of humanity, the one who has caused untold destruction, the one who had, who had brought temptation into the Garden of Eden and ruined forever the perfect image of God that was in humanity, he will stand before King Jesus, he will bow his knee, and then he will be cast into hell. That's a very comforting thought to me, that my great enemy will one day suffer the wrath of my king. Unbelievers who have rejected Jesus and have embraced the rule of the Antichrist, guess what? They will bow before the king before they're cast into hell. All of creation will bow before King Jesus. He bends this world to his will. He uses Satan. This is what's amazing about here in verse 17. For God has put it into their hearts. Satan thinks that he's railing against the Lord and warring against the Lord. He thinks that there's a moment where he might have victory, but it's God's plan all along. God put it into his heart so that ultimately the words of God would be fulfilled. Philippians 2, 9, and 11, 9 through 11. For this reason, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, you will kneel before King Jesus one way or another. You will either kneel before him as an enemy about to be vanquished, or you will kneel before him as a son, an adopted son in his kingdom. Where are you this morning? Which kingdom do you belong to? Are you a part still of the kingdom that you were born into, the kingdom of darkness? Or have you come to faith in Jesus Christ, accepted his free gift, his free offer of salvation in him, and become part of the kingdom of heaven? I can't make that choice for you. Your parents can't make that choice for you. Your friends can't. Your pastor can't. Your deacon can't make that choice. You have to look and recognize the depravity of your heart. You have to recognize the depth of your sin. You have to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Babylon's going to fall, church. This is nothing but good news this morning. Babylon's going to fall. This world that seems so dark, 
and discouraging and unbeatable, it's going to fall before the power and the glory of King Jesus at the end of all things. Take comfort in that promise, and today, live like a citizen of heaven. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to enter into a time where we're going to come to the table of the Lord and take communion this morning. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to enter into that. I'm not going to have a time of invitation like we normally do. But if you have a decision to make, if you want to trust in Jesus as your Savior this morning, and you've never done that, after the service is over, please come talk to me, or please come talk to Thomas, talk to Barry, talk to one of our deacons. We would love to explain in greater depth what it means to be saved. But at this point, we're going to go into prayer, and then we're going to come to the table of the Lord and remember his sacrifice on the cross for us. Father, I love you, Lord, and I thank you for your word. Thank you for Revelation 17 that shows us that Satan's kingdom is going to fall. Lord, all the power that he has right now and all the influence and all the destruction he's causing and all the the wicked things in this world, they're going to bow the knee to you one day. I praise you for that, Lord. You are sovereign, you are holy, and you are just, and one day you will make all things right. We trust in you. We throw our eternities, Lord, in your hands. We trust in you for more than just our our daily bread, but we trust in you, Lord, for our eternal destination. And we believe this morning your promise that you will rescue your people and that we'll spend eternity with you someday. Father, I love you, Lord, and I'm so eternally grateful for the gift of salvation that we have in Christ Jesus as we celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus this morning in communion. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray as we rehearse the gospel that you would, your name would be lifted on high. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.